day five of uh, uh, simulation week organized by Saudi Simulation Society. And uh, I'm Saeed Jamil. I'm one of your panelists here today. Uh, we, we have a very uh, exciting session today uh, with, with, uh, with the speakers joining us uh, through United Kingdom. And uh, today's focus is mainly the, the, the simulation and using the simulation for the for, for as a tool for quality improvement and team building and skill building. And uh, we, we have Dr. Sayed Mohinuddin here. And then later on, we will have a, a Dr. Ravi uh, and Dr. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Bharat Ayyeb is our co-host. Uh, I think he got stuck somewhere. So hopefully once he joined, he might take over from me for the time being, I will, I will, be, I will be the host. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Sayed Mohinuddin. Uh, Dr. Mohinuddin is a fellow Royal College of Pediatric and Child Health. Uh, he also ha has a DC DCH, MSc, and he's very experienced uh, clinician in terms of uh, his, his clinical expertise. He's a neurologist, but he is... Uh, a very experienced uh, simulation educator as well. So let me just uh, briefly tell you about his current uh, uh, responsibilities. So he's a consultant near neonatologist at London uh, Neonatal Transfer Service, which is attached with the Bart Health NHS Trust. He's training program director, London School of Pediatrics. Uh, and he also director for neonatal emergency simulation team, which is the NEST program. He's also clinical director for Neomate Clinical Application Project. And I'm sure we will ask Dr. Mohinuddin later on to tell us about this new mate as well. Uh, and he is associate non-executive director for London Norwich University uh, Hospital. Uh, we've got Dr. Bara here as well. So after introduction, I will hand over to Dr. Bara. Uh, Dr. Bratayeb, can you take over from me? And Yes, uh, hi. Thank and, you. And, why, and, and invite Dr. Sayyid Mohinuddin. I've already done his introduction and uh, you, you, can, you can take over uh, from me. So Dr. Uh, Sayyid Mohinuddin, uh, topic today is, uh, uh, let me just open his, uh, his, his topic. So he will be talking about the simulation as tool for high quality care. Yeah, simulation as a tool for high quality care. Over to uh, Dr. Baratayeb and Dr. Sayyid Mohinuddin. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, Dr. Syed uh, will give 25, around 25 minutes for presentation, and then I will give five, 10 minutes for questions and move to the next presentation. Go ahead, Dr. Syed, and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and greetings from London. Uh, can you see my slides and can you hear me all right? We we'll see you and hear you all right. And your slides. Uh, I am grateful um, to the panel for inviting me and thank you very much. And uh, uh, just as a housekeeping point, I, I've just got a message from Dr. Swami who's currently in India uh, that he's not able to join uh, because, the, the, because of some technical error. Uh, doctor, uh, I, I just request either Dr. Sayed or um, one of the panel members to just communicate with him. I'll pass on his uh, number to Dr. Jamil. Sure, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. So um, now uh, this is a collaborative work. So I I uh, work for Bart's Health and the photograph you see is the Royal London Hospital. And Dr. Sini Lau is my clinical, senior clinical fellow. And she has a lot of uh, experience in um, simulation and simulation-based education. She's done a master's in medical education. Unfortunately, uh, she, her uh, a family member uh, took ill last night and she's currently in the hospital. So she uh, uh, sends her apologies, but I'm going to cover her slides as well. So 
uh, you definitely get um, the same session, but from me rather than from Dr. Lau. And uh, my um, uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Ravi Swami, who uh, will introduce himself, um, will we'll continue after my session. So I think, as Dr. Bara said, uh, we'll um, try and do it in three part sessions. So I'm going to start off with um, bringing together how simulation can be used as a tool for high quality care. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about clinical care, I'm talking about operational delivery, I'm talking about leadership. And uh, so it's, it's spanning all aspects of care. Uh, how can we use simulation as a vehicle for transformation? And I'm sure a lot of you uh, use simulation as a tool, uh, but it's about that aligned thinking and how can we build a safety culture through collaboration? Sini's talk would have uh, focused on um, using, so how did we model this? Uh, uh, and I'll showcase my clinical service, which is London's neonatal transfer service uh, our, as a case study. How did we model the safety culture and continue to do so? and how we have used both clinical and non-clinical simulation. And our focus has been on the role of team training, not about individual training, but about team training. And how do we, or how did we continue to uh, create clinical and operational collaborations with, uh, um, with other members or other units across London, um, which is about spanning about 30 hospitals, and then how did we extend this model uh, from uh, a UK-based model to an international perspective? And that's where Ravi comes in, wherein he shares our journey of collaboration, communication, and cultural sort of shift from um, UK, Europe, uh, to the Indian subcontinent, where we've actually focused a lot in India, uh, because that's where I come from originally, and I think Ravi as well. And uh, then we went uh, into some of the other middle, uh, other sort of southeastern countries, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, and we've done a few courses in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia before the pandemic struck. So, uh, so he's going to tell us about scaling the project and measuring the impact of the program. Uh, so. Um, and I think Dr. Jamil very kindly introduced me. On the right, you see my clinical sort of hat wherein I'm a consultant neonatologist for uh, the Royal London Hospitals and I lead the London's neonatal transfer service. So we connect about 30 hospitals across London. Uh, on the left here is uh, one of the sites of London Northwest University Hospitals, where I wear more of a management and leadership hat, um, being a non-executive director there. And then on the bottom here is the, um, the Senate House from the University of London, and I'm uh, a part of the Health Education England, and I, uh, that I'm a training program director for pediatrics uh, for, the, for the London region. So apart from that, I, I continue to teach on um, the uh, NLS, which is the equivalent of the NRP program in the United Kingdom. And I'm also a, a GIC trainer with Advanced Life Support Group and uh, the NEST program and the Neomate, which I'll introduce to you as part of this culture of simulation uh, during uh, my talk. Now, before even we go into, so why, why are we doing all this? Because we want to deliver high quality care. The question is, what is high quality care? And is uh, the definition of, are we aligned on high quality care? And I think that's uh, something that of course we have to define for each of us, uh, but for us, we've taken the IHI definition, essentially that it has to be safe, it has to be effective, it has to be patient-centric, and it has to be timely, um, efficient, and equitable. And each of those uh, aspects is, is a whole world in itself. And uh, perhaps si simulation can address a lot of those areas, which I can uh, I'll hopefully highlight to you as we go along. 
Uh, but very often when asked, how does simulation help? People just say it's about safety. Of course it is about safety, but you can actually impact a lot of the other areas for providing high quality care using simulation as a tool. And, uh, and of course the, the, the King's Health, um, King's Foundation definition that at the end of the day, we are trying to deliver the best possible health and care for all. And that means we got to tackle the worst um, um, health outcomes and tackle the inequalities. I mean, where I, I work, it is, uh, it's got a lot of affluence on one side and it's got huge amount of deprivation on the other side. So how do you balance the inequalities? How do you create healthy places? And, and I'm not talking about just patients, I'm talking about staff, I'm talking about a culture wherein everyone's healthy. How do you create that sort of healthy community? And that's where the leadership angle comes in. And at the end of the day, it, it will only happen when there is a supportive culture from, for everyone, for patients, for staff, and, uh, and driven by the leaders. So I think leadership is integral to this um, to simulation as well. Um, so in my, this specific talk for the next 25 minutes or so, I will look into why simulation is a great tool. Uh, as we know, it is an experiential sort of form of learning aiming towards transformation. Uh, we touch upon the concept of human fallibility, um, human factors and crisis resource management principles, and look into how uh, the skill set and progression can happen uh, from an individual practitioner level to a team level to a systems approach. We're going to also talk a little bit about how do we create a high quality and safe simulation program? Because it's not just something that you tick a box. And I think uh, I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar that uh, how we train our faculty, how do we facilitate and debrief simulation is critical to creating a psychologically safe learning environment. Um, and then we'll try and uh, finish with some standards and some strategic tools and how do you map the pro progress and, and, and create some key performance indicators. So here's how the journey began for me. And I think sharing my story is perhaps useful because it might, you might relate to my story. I completed my clinical training more, uh, more than a decade and a half ago and uh, joined the London's neonatal transfer service as a neonatologist. And I was thinking, wow, this should be a great team. This is London, there should not be any problems. Uh, there is lots of knowledge here. There is lots of um, clinical skill here. There is lots of resource here. So I was expecting a smooth ride. And what did I find? I found that there are babies who are still cold in hospitals and referred to us for transfer. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is basics. Uh, you, you don't expect a cold baby. Why is it happening? We still had babies with uh, endotracheal tubes placed um, in the, not in the trachea or slipped down the right main bronchus. We found babies with unrecognized pneumothoraces. We found babies who the team knew what to do, but were not able to apply the knowledge and skill to, in their clinical care. And I started asking the question, why? Why is it happening uh, that despite all the knowledge that we have, despite the clinical skill that we have, the clinical care of our patients is not 100%. It's, it is suboptimal. And that inquiry um, led me to this whole um, discovery for my own self. Although I, I realized that the world knew about it, but I didn't know about the whole concept of uh, team training, human factors, um, CRM, this is crisis resource management principles. And then I started thinking, how can I learn from this? How can I make my team learn from this? And how, how do we spread this knowledge? And that was the birth of our simulation program in London NTS. So, and, and as you know, that uh, there are many ways to learn. Of course, most people learn uh, theoretically. So um, you, can, you can read a book on how to swim. That's great. You've mastered it. You've 
done the MCQs, you've done everything possible, but uh, jump into the water and that's what happens. You've got that, uh, I've, I've learned how to swim theoretically, but I've actually not learned how to swim in water. And that is the real purpose. And I kind of felt like exactly that because we do a lot of training and sometimes, you know, our trainees, whichever faculty, it's not just medical, nursing, you know, allied health practitioners. So a lot of us are experts in theory, but when it comes to uh, practical management and application, that's where we struggle. And understanding why we struggle and what is needed will be helpful in uh, making progress. Now, do we need to reinvent the wheel? Perhaps not. So talking about service, at the end of the day, in clinical world, we provide service to our patients. What about another kind of service? So here's a, a Ferrari pit stop in Formula One. So some of you might be familiar or enthusiasts maybe. So a car comes in at some massive speed, greater than 200 kilometers uh, per hour, that sort of speed, it comes and stops exactly on those lines. And there is this team of people uh, who service the car. They take out the four wheels, they put back new four wheels. They may have to refuel, they may have to do safety checks. Uh, of course, in order to do that, they have to lift the car up. So they have these jacks in the front and back. And they do all that. And I was surprised when I saw the world record for Ferrari is 2.2 seconds. So they do manage to do all that and they do it with a very high quality and they, they do it with a exceptional amount of safety in 2.2 seconds. How is it that they can do this while we have CPR situations where lives are at stake and, and we, we of course do it as well, but is that high quality and precision maintained? Can we learn from other teams? And this is where some, some of the colleagues actually invited Ferrari guys uh, to come and look at uh, our intensive care um, uh, handovers that happen between post cardiac bypass surgeries between um, the cardiac service and, and pediatric intensive care when I was at Great Ormond Street. And um, there are lessons to be learned because they talk about how they prepare, they think about everything, they have allocated roles and there are safety backups. So they have plan A, plan B, and they are constantly looking for where can error come from. And uh, the culture is inbuilt the culture of safety is inbuilt amongst the team. And when they came and saw the clinical team, they, they really thought that we were not focused and they, uh, we were all over the place. So they gave us some top tips. So now the handover processes are actually designed by Formula One uh, in the post-cardiac um, uh, transfer of patients and recovery. And, and there are lessons that we have come away learning. So this team, the key thing is they practice, they practice, they simulate all the time. And only, you know, when the season comes, they go into whichever the Grand Prix that they are going into. Um, but what about our clinical times? Do we have the time? Do we have the personnel? Do we have the resource? And these are questions uh, you can ask yourself and you can perhaps ask your leaders because as it, uh, wearing my leadership hat, that's what I'm thinking. This is what we need to provide if we want to create high quality care. What about, uh, we, we eat McDonald's all the time and uh, you, you see that there is this culture of service. There is service, everything's seamless, everything's standardized. It doesn't matter whether you're in London, whether you're in uh, Dubai, Riyadh or, or Vancouver. Um, the, the, the standards, standardization of the process is really seamless. And um, is there something, again, that we can learn from businesses such as McDonald's where uh, there is a lot of simulation, there's a lot of practice, there's a lot of standardization. People uh, in the military and the armed forces do it all the time. They, the real battle is very rare. They're constantly practicing most of the time. And now, 
Uh, some of the, I, I've, I've heard from uh, friends that they now practice in using virtual reality simulation. So they don't have to actually muddy their boots and end up in a jungle or a, tron a trench or air air uh, airlifted uh, or dropped on some uh, uneven field. They can do all that using a simulated virtual reality platform. So there are uh, technologies which are there, which are enhancing simulation to a whole different level. I'm, and I'm sure you've heard of all the pilots who train. So that's a, a advanced pilot simulator for a A350. Uh, and um, it, it will be as if you are in the real cockpit. Of course, you're not in the real cockpit. You're in that white globe hanging on these um, platforms and, and you experience everything, including the turbulence, the motion, the, uh, the feeling as if everything is in a real air, aircraft. So it's about the fidelity and how uh, can we bring that fidelity to clinical systems. So with all those sort of examples, um, uh, here we are, of course, we, we do a lot of simulation as well. The question is, um, uh, are we applying the, the, the sort of high quality in simulation to the work that we are doing? And if not, uh, what needs to be improved? Uh, I also want to sort of uh, get a message here that it's not always about high quality or high tech stuff. It is more about uh, how can you achieve the learning? So I think it's more important to define what your learning outcomes are. So we initially didn't have that sort of resource. We were practicing with just uh, um, mannequins which were not even high tech, um, non, non sort of, uh, um, all the sort of electrical and electronic mannequins. But the idea was that, can you still solve clinical problems or operational problems? Can you still uh, learn the principles of communication? Can you still bring about that culture of being supportive, uh, caring, trusting, collaborative? And, and I think the important thing is not just sort of, there's a real risk of getting lost into uh, high tech and give me more money and I'll do it. But the idea is making sure that you're clear and focused on your learning outcomes and use the technology and fidelity to achieve that rather than being subservient to just getting the most high tech equipment and, and actually uh, not worrying too much about the learning outcomes. So, so to me, it's about defining the purpose to where do you want to reach? And then where are you at the moment? And then trying to get clear about the gap uh, from where you are to where you would like to go and how simulation can be useful in navigating that journey. Um, and of course, we talked a little bit about knowledge. Knowledge is useful and important, but it's more about application of that knowledge and skill in, in your ability to manage the patient as a team. I think that's where our impact has been. That's where our experience has been. And that's where we A, analyzed the gap, made sure that where our weaknesses are and then focus so that we can create a maximum impact. I think you know, it's really important to mention the role of the trainer or enabler in this. I purposely use the word enabler because not all uh, senior people need not be faculty sim instructors, they need to know that they have a role of enabling people to learn, to build their com confidence, to build progressive competence. And I think swimming is a great example. You see that uh, this person is trying to help this child who's really scared of water in, in trying to say, you, you are fine, you're safe, and you can now slowly build your skill level till they can become a proficient swimmer. So I think that same sort of um, uh, symbolic methodology applies to the world of clinical um, uh, simulation as well. Now, in the end, why are we doing all this? And I think, again, uh, to reinforce the message, we created some of the resources in, in London uh, as, as short video clips, and I'll play one for you. Good morning, it's Friday morning in London. Every day, we all make thousands of decisions. Come on, Alice, hurry up! You'll be late for school. 
Most of the time, we don't even notice we're making them. It's only natural we sometimes make mistakes. Some go unnoticed. Hello. Could you hold on one minute? One minute. And some don't. Bye, darling. With busy lives, we often juggle responsibilities. And to cope, we sometimes take shortcuts. Or do more than one thing at a time. Good morning. On my way to work, in a bit of a rush. Yeah, yeah. You'll change? Yep, you're fine. However, your errors can affect everyone. You. Hi, sweetheart, what's the matter? Your family. No, I don't have the keys. I definitely didn't leave the house with them. Your patience. We all make mistakes. Understanding why will help keep your patients safe. <laughs> So I think having resources which can energize and can motivate and direct people towards this sort of methodology are really useful. And that's something that enablers can do for you. Um, and certainly, you know, that, that has been our experience. Um, you may not have a lot of resource, but if you have the right enablers, they will try and help you find that resource. Now, coming to the, the nuts and bolts of it, you, as, as uh, you know, you're very familiar, simulation is a method of experiential learning. So while reading a book to swim or how to cycle is a good idea, but it means nothing till you actually jump into the water and, and, and are safe and can swim or um, you know, start riding a bicycle. But the, you know, behind the scenes, why is it that simulation provides you with that experiential learning? And this is the only theoretical slide I will put here. Uh, rest of it is shared experience. I'm not an academic. So COBE uh, is one of the foremost uh, in, th in terms of experiential learning. So uh, he postulated one has an experience, a concrete experience. So it's, let's say that, um, well, um, you know, my son wanted to ride a bicycle and he thought riding a bicycle is easy. Uh, Daddy, I need a bicycle. I will sit on it and I will go, I will pedal. That's his understanding of riding a bicycle. Then what happens? He rides a bicycle, he sits on the bicycle, he starts pedaling, and next thing he falls on the ground. Um, something happened. So then there is that phase of reflective observation. Right. I thought that riding a bicycle is that easy, but obviously it's not. What happened then? So it's about this idea called balance, which can't be explained so that, but it's an abstract concept that he's constructed now in his mind. Well, I, I, I need to get that balance right. And obviously it, it takes a few times of experimentation. Uh, you apply something that you've learned in the previous cycle again, and then uh, the cycle repeats it, itself. And that's how you learn by experience. Now in in giving that feedback, what is very important, and sometimes you know that's where the facilitators, um, in my experience, uh, need to be very clear is to explore those feelings, and that's where uh, you know Roger Greenway's theory comes in. So what happened? What and, and that's what the facilitator would ask in in that uh, debrief. What happened? You you wanted to ride a bicycle, and you thought it is as simple as sitting on the saddle. Um, you know, and, and riding and, and, and uh, pedaling away, but uh, what did you experience and how did you feel about it? So feelings are really important to try and connect that. And then uh, once you explore the feelings, you then have some objectivity. Why did that happen? Right. Uh, okay. I thought it was like this, but it wasn't. I need to do this, that, and that. So you've now reached that point by yourself, not somebody telling you what to do. And obviously then they, uh, you know, what will you do next time uh, comes after that. 
And having that sort of an approach is really, really important in order to make sure that the learner is at the center of this, not uh, receiving information in a passive way. And, and finally, Ar Argaris and Sean, as you know, um, they, they, that's where they conceptualize, uh, con conceptualize it as a theory where um, action, behavior, and consequences are, are considered, and then you revise your theory and implement a revised theory. Um, uh, lots of material on this, but essentially that's the, the, the basis of experiential learning. Why, why is experiential learning better than any other form of learning? Because it gives us deeper insights and it gives us longer lasting learning. And I think that's where um, the, the, the real benefit comes in. Because why, in the, at the end of the day, why are we doing the simulation? Because you want to create that learning conversation. And these conversations are the real conversations for change or perhaps even to transform. And I would say that really when applied in a, in a high quality way, you really are not aiming for just change, you're aiming for transformation. Uh, because change is, you can make something bigger, better, lesser, more, some version of the previous. Whereas when it comes to transformation, it is, creating a better something, not the same thing which is slightly different, uh, and hence the role of transformation. But this can only happen uh, when you have someone really, really uh, adept at debriefing and creating that conversation for transformation. And it, the, the precursor, the real important condition in order to make it happen is psychological safety. So as uh, it's not about doing a course and saying that I'm a sim instructor or facilitator, it's about having that experience, the, uh, again, a lot of experiential learning in both applying the art form of, uh, and, and also the science behind debriefing. And I think that's the real key to creating the psychological safety and, and, a, and a learning environment where the focus is not uh, about the process. The focus is not about the, the system. The focus is the learner. So you are there constantly looking at the gap between how the person is doing, meaning it's their behaviors and what should they be and how do you then let them bridge the gap, uh, holding their hands, providing that safety. So it's a lot of responsibility. And I often uh, bring the concept of context and content in, in, in our courses. And that's because, um, and, and this is one of the pictures I show, I mean, there's a slice of pizza on a manhole somewhere. And the same slice of pizza is in a nice plate in a nice restaurant and everything like that. So the question is the content, which is the slice of pizza remains the same, whereas the context has changed. And, and obviously based on the concept, the whole meaning, no one's gonna to touch that pizza on the manhole, whereas everyone likes to have a pizza in a nice restaurant. So the context gives the meaning to the content. And that's a very important construct to build into simulation. I am not going to show you Martin Bromley's video, but this is one of the, uh, major sort of um, uh, resources that I use in uh, uh, in in our uh, simulation courses, wherein uh, Martin, who's an airline pilot, uh, lost his wife um, in a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario, and he was he he has done a huge amount of work in uh, in spreading this message of human factors and how can we mitigate the risk of uh, our, uh, our fallibility, because at the end of the day, no matter how good we are, how experienced we are, we are human, and that means we will be fallible. We will. The, the, we, so we need people around us. We need systems around us, or, which will protect us from our own humanness, and that is inbuilt uh, within the culture of a team. And that's what makes a team have that sort of a culture wherein they're supportive and they are constantly applying um, systems and principles uh, which are useful. 
sometimes, you know, no matter how much systems you have, there is also that idea that can you um, actually land a plane or uh, can you actually manage that system and provide that leadership required? I think, um, you know, this is a video or the, the actual voice is the real voice, but it's an animated sequence of the Hudson landing. And there are some lessons perhaps to, um, you know, achieve from this. I'll play this and let you, um, you know, experience it yourself. Check this 1549, 700, climbing 5,000. Check this 1549, urge departure to contact, climb, maintain 15,000. Maintain 15,000, check this 1549. Cactus 1549, turn left heading 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539, hit first to cross the thrust. I'm hoping to return back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. Tyler, stop you to park. He's got emergency returning. Okay. Cactus 1529, he, he uh, bird strike. He lost all engine. He lost the thrust in the engines. He's returning immediately. Cactus 1529, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus 1529, we can get it for you. Do you want to try to land 1913? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. All right, Cactus 1549, it's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire, actually, LaGuardia departs guy, emergency inbound. Hey, go ahead. Cactus 1529 over the George Washington Bridge wants to go to the airport right now. Wants to go to our airport. Check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes. He, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway 1? Runway 1. That's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280. You can land bird runway strike. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay. Which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry. Say again, Cactus. Cactus 1549, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle a pilot who has almost made up their mind having that situational awareness, an air traffic controller who's trying to look at options and making sure that they're trying to give them the right option. Amazing level of calm in the in the voice of the pilot. And there's so many things you can actually debrief just from that. Uh, conversation on communication. But of course, one has to be clear that um, the pilot who landed, of course, became um, you know, a hero, but he could have got it wrong. And sometimes there is the con concept of hero worship wherein uh, you do good and you praise, but of course, one has to have a system in which um, even failure can be discussed in a uh, uh, supportive and logical sequence. And, and that is not that easy. Uh, celebrating su success, of course, is much better and easier, but uh, that will only come when you are able to embrace both failure and success. Uh, here are the CRM principles. So crisis resource management principles, Ral and Daba proposed them in 2005. This is published evidence, but uh, unfortunately, how many people use those principles in the way they design their services, in the way their training happens? And this is not some sort of a rocket science. These are uh, a simple, clear, um, plain language principle, call for help early, anticipate and plan, uh, use all available resources and so on. Um, so that's something that I realized when I started, we were not using this the, and, and a lot of uh, other teams were not using it. So the question is, are you using it and, and what is your experience been? And so really in, in, in pretty much all our courses, it's not just about clinical, uh, uh, clinical aspects of simulation. It's also about providing insights into why things go wrong, uh, introducing people to human factors in CRM, providing structured approach to emergencies, emphasizing the importance of effective communication and really using immersive simulation and team training. Um, and the word is team. Uh, just to re-emphasize, it's not about individual training. Uh, now, we this is a map of London uh, where all the hospitals are based and the, 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 the green are the big centers, academic centers, 
and uh, the the blue ones are the district general hospitals and the uh, the yellow ones are smaller centers. So what we took uh, is more like a hub and spoke model, where in each of the bigger centers, the green centers looks after the, that patch. But we as a, a Pan London service, we, we cater to all those 30 odd centers uh, across London. And we have a systematic program of education and outreach. And that's where the collaboration comes in because it's not just good to do something in your own team, how can you bring that same level of expertise, know-how, and, and, and that level of clinical collaboration and, and learning collaboration across the patch? And, and that's where uh, we go out to each of these centers every uh, year, maybe once or twice. We, uh, we work alongside the clinicians there and we do all sorts of simulations. We do clinical simulations, but we also do a lot of non-clinical simulation because that's such a good platform wherein you can use communication, you can use team building, you can use leadership skills, problem solving uh, skills, um, situational awareness, all sorts of things. And then more recently, we, we've been using Lego as a, a, a tool for simulation as well. And I, I, uh, some of you might have heard of Lego Serious Play, which is uh, actually used by Fortune 500 companies in the boardrooms. And it's a fantastic tool um, to, because our brains have got our hands as one of the biggest represented area in the cerebral cortex. So what you think is much more manifested in your hands than anywhere else. So it's that brain, uh, brain hand connection, which is exploited in Lego Serious Play. And, and we've been certainly having a lot of joy with uh, Lego Serious Play in our setup uh, and across London. Um, and, and I think we miss opportunities. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for debrief. One does not uh, need to create a simulation in order to just debrief. You can use real life situations to debrief. The only thing is to create that debrief, perhaps after a ward round, after uh, some sort of a recess that you've had, after an emergency, after a challenging case, following um, either an inter-hospital transfer or multi-team interaction, and more recently, we've started, uh, we've used the COVID pandemic as, a, as a, a good opportunity because communication is particularly difficult when you have a FFP3 mask, a visor on top, you've got your gear, uh, the full hazmat suit, et cetera, and communicating. And, uh, and, and because of all this, your non-verbal communication is extremely challenged. And, and hence, uh, we use this to do a lot of communication-based simulation. So hopefully in the last, um, you know, maybe more than 20 minutes now, I've, um, you know, impressed upon the idea that simulation is uh, one of the tools, but a very important tool within, within your toolkit, um, which is aiming to provide high quality and safe care. And I think it's not just about clinical management. You've got to think a little bit beyond the operational management in order to provide that sort of uh, care. I'd like to leave you or finish this part of the, uh, the, the whole webinar with, with this question or this quote from uh, Mr. Krishnamurti. He really impresses upon not for looking for solutions, but asking the right questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sayed, for, I mean, really, really interesting talk. Um, I thought the slides and the, the context uh, you've used and representing the content were, were really great. I'm, I'm really impressed with the, with the visuals uh, you, you've used in this talk. Um, any questions before we move to the next talk from uh, our attendees? Uh, please write the question in the Q&A section. Um, so Dr. Sayed, um, I have one question, which is, uh, I think it's it's good, it's um, very interesting for us here in, in, this, in Saudi Arabia, because we now, are uh, somehow trying to build through the Society of Simulation and Healthcare um, accreditation system where uh, 
uh, like you have the big centers in the big cities have uh, great capabilities uh, and uh, uh, well, well but, but when you start going into the small areas small cities you don't have those simulation centers and i think that flower picture map you showed us was really great um, how did you were you able to connect the smaller centers to the big centers was there any uh, like uh, big conflicts between who who runs who or who's the boss or or something like that uh, uh, do that would be great for our experience too. Thank you, Dr. Bara. And I think you know, that, that's a really um, important question, very important question. Uh, yes, there will always be resistance to change. Uh, there will always be big egos and personalities, which are always there, whether uh, whichever part of the world we go in. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, what I found was why do we do what we do? It's about everyone, whichever center, big or small, we want to achieve good patient care. We want to achieve safe patient care. It's in our own interest. And also in the, it's the vision, it's the goal that connects us all. So while there can be small differences, as long as it's not about, so one, one of the biggest hindrances has been, oh, well, we don't want to do your course. We will do our course. And very often I say to them, not a problem at all. Let's do, it's not my course at all. Do it your way, because as long as the principles are met, we have no issues. And, and then people slowly drop their resistance because when they see that you are not there to make a, a build an empire or, or conquer their center or something, people drop their resistance and people are much more happier to collaborate and, and, and work together. And I'm pretty sure I've, I've got, I've had a, a small stint of working in Riyadh, but I, I think uh, you've got fantastic facilities. I mean, I've only experienced Riyadh, but um, I, I was amazed at the level of um, ex, uh, expertise and equipment that was available. I hope I've yeah. answered your question. Thank you. We have one question uh, then uh, from Prof. Boker, who is, um, considered as the father of simulation in, in, in our region in Saudi Arabia. He's asking, please, can you shed some light on the impact measures? Indeed, I think, you know, I, I, I don't claim to be an academic. I'm, I'm just a student of simulation uh, with, a, with a view to make a difference. That's all it is. And I think it's very important important to have impact, um, to measure impact. And, I, and I'm sure, as you know, uh, reaching a Kirkpatrick level three evidence is very difficult. Level two, perhaps you can get, and that's what we have done. So Ravi will present to you some of the work we've done uh, from UK and from Indian context. And I think we, we wanted to write up a little bit of the Saudi experience as well. Uh, and and um, Dr. Siraj, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he presented uh, in one of the sessions, we've, we, we worked together with him. Um, but I think it's really important to get some level three evidence out. And we, yeah. we are working on that in London uh, as well, uh, but it's a challenging area. So Prof is right. I, I think we all need evidence and, and it's very difficult to prove to the management, to the people who give money to say, why are you putting all this time and money into it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sayed. Well, hopefully someday we can even reach this level for evidence. Who knows? Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. So we'll move to Dr. Swami's presentation. Uh, if Dr. Swami wanna share, and then we can come back to you, Dr. Sayed. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, th that's absolutely fine. So Ravi can go next and then I'll come back. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saeb, for the um, invitation and uh, uh, Syed as well. I'm having some technical issues. So my camera, it is not letting me show the uh, thing as well. So as long as you guys can see my slide and hear me, that should be okay. So if you let me know if you can see my slide and hear me as well, please. Yes, we can see you and hear you, and I'm just going to give a small introduction. Dr. Swami, he is a consultant unitologist at the Imperial College Healthcare, NHS, uh, in London. Also, he's a junk professor of pediatrics at Manipal University in India. 
is the director of the neonatal emergency simulation team, training courses, and prenatal trials unit. And he is a national trainer um, for the infant development in Pearson. Um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Swami, for your time. Uh, we really appreciate your presence with us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Taib, and uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, so, uh, as uh, Syed was uh, already talking about uh, simulation being used as a tool, um, how it can uh, help in delivering high quality care, I'll try to uh, show how we have implemented those uh, theoretic theoretical aspects uh, and how we have uh, helped in bringing about change uh, in uh, multiple places where um, we have conducted these courses. And um, the whole idea here is that uh, we are uh, transferring skills. So we are actually skill building in local areas. So it's the local capacity building so that the sustenance of the quality of care happens. And so that's the whole idea of my talk. So in the next uh, um, uh, 15, 20 minutes, what I'll try to focus on will be how simulation can help improving the quality and safety uh, wherever you practice. And uh, the, just the journey of the NEST. NEST is basically the neonatal emergency simulation training courses, how, um, how we did, why we did, and what we did. And so that, that should help um, everyone who wants to start some projects. And then I'll focus on scaling up, how can we use this to skill build and how to develop partnerships. And finally, as Syed mentioned, the crisis resources management principles. There are multiple of them, but to, uh, what worked for us uh, in scaling up? And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So that's what I'll try to cover in the next uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes. So as uh, Syed uh, has mentioned, um, you have quality of care. Now the question is, what is high quality of neonatal care? Um, there will be some frameworks, which will be the gold standard, and that's what you need to aim for. For example, in the UK, we have the, uh, the British Association of uh, Pediatric Medicine, so BAPM, they give us standards. There are some non-organizations like the BLISS who also give standards. So these are or some ways in India as well, the aims which will give the standards. So um, your aim is you need to look for your local uh, benchmarks. <clears throat> so in uh, Saudi, what will be your benchmarks and then that's where your unit should aim for and that is what's your high quality is and you want to get that quality delivered and one of the tools for getting that high quality can be simulation there are multiple other tools but simulation is one of the most effective tool in helping you reach your aim of high quality uh, neonatal care and as I also mentioned, it's also quite safe because uh, that psychological safety uh, is uh, very important when uh, you are building your teams and uh, simulation helps to give that confidence in your uh, team members that yes, this is a time where I can ask the most um, stupid question, which I think it's a stupid question, but they are always afraid to ask in front of your patients, but it's a time where they can ask those questions, where they can make those mistakes and feel uh, safe. So that psychological safety is important for the team and that gives the safety for your patients. So that's uh, what I wanted to convey in that particular slide. Now, uh, there is this concept of uh, content and uh, concept, uh, context, which uh, again, I had mentioned earlier. So what, what it means is that uh, uh, the, co the content can vary all the time, but the context is what is more important. And here, what I'm doing is that I'm going to show you how I use the uh, three-stage uh, model to start something new. So the content here is the NEST courses, uh, how we built up the NEST courses. But the context is it can be applied for anything new which you guys want to start, not necessarily simulation, but something which you want to do. Then these are the three things uh, which you will have to uh, work on. The first I, is to build and make the idea into a prototype. As long as it's in your head, it is very clear for you, but the other person does not know what you are trying to talk or they imagine in a different way. So always building the prototype and showcasing people like this is what I want to do. 
that is your first step. So idea to prototype. And once you have the prototype built, it has to be validated. So uh, someone, uh, a peer groups or someone expert should say, yeah, this is what it looks like. These are good, these are not so good. You need to work on this so that you can uh, do a better job. So then the prototype is validated. Once you have the validated prototype, you can start scaling. So these are the three important steps what you will all use for starting something new. So let me show what the content for here is that, let me show how uh, we did the Nest courses in uh, uh, India. And uh, uh, of course, in Riyadh, when I had come to do the uh, courses in Riyadh, Nepal and Sri Lanka. So, um, so first thing was the idea was uh, when we started doing the Nest courses in London, uh, Syed, Mark, uh, multiple of us, we used to do these courses. And then once uh, me and Syed had a long chat, almost like multiple occasions, multiple brainstorms, and how we can start uh, taking these courses uh, to India. Because I was, I trained in, uh, UK since 2001 to uh, 2012 and for family reasons I had to come back to India for about three four years and so between 2013 to 2016 I entirely practiced in India before 2016 I took a job in Imperial and I do part-time job in Imperial and part-time in India now. So, um, so for the first three years when I was in India uh, so me and Syed had uh, multiple uh, um, brainstorming. So the idea was in our uh, mind, but we wanted to bring it into uh, the prototype. And our aim throughout the entire thing was that we wanted to empower uh, the people uh, wherever they are, wherever they're working, so that they can improve the quality of care, neurotic care. It's not that if I can go and I do it, yes, okay, I can only improve one unit, maybe two units. But the, the thing is that if you improve the people who are working in those places, then they will uh, cascade the information and that should help in the improving the uh, neonatal care. And so finally, after multiple discussions with Syed, we adapted to the prototype. Uh, we made uh, the course from the London course to more suitable to the Indian settings. And then that's the first prototype course which we did in partnership with the National Neurology Forum of India in uh, 30th of November. So we started brainstorming in uh, almost 2012 and it took almost two years before we could actually uh, bring the course, uh, implement the course. So for the first course, we had all the faculty trained from the UK who were there. Uh, usually for any uh, simulation course, we can only take about uh, 28, maximum 32 people, but despite closing the registrations, there was a huge, uh, one try and we almost had 45 uh, people in the first course. So uh, the course ran uh, successfully and then uh, we were quite happy. We had a lot of feedbacks and stuff. And then uh, we had feedbacks from the people who attended the course and who people, external uh, experts as well. So now that we had shown our prototype, now it was time for us to go back and validate uh, what we had done. So we took two forms of validation. One was the immediate feedback from the people after the course, and then about six months or one year down the line to find out how they have made any difference in their own units. So uh, the first immediate feedback we were asking people who attended the course, was it relevant to their educational leads? And as you can see on the left circle, more than 50% of the people felt it was highly relevant for their educational leads. In the second uh, circle, you can see the course was very effective uh, uh, and some people also told definitely effective, but very effective uh, is what we were looking for. Then we had asked people, have you come across these factors called human factors? And uh, that is something new which people had not come across. So if you can see before training, um, most of them had not come across only a, a few as you a few amount of people knew a fair idea about uh, um, human factors. Post course, obviously in the course, we drill and drill about the human factors. And um, uh, you could see that people were absolutely confident what human factors were and how they impact in delivering the quality of care. So uh, if you're looking at the aviation industry, uh, where the CRM principles came, 85% of the uh, 
uh, crashes of the plane crashes have been related to human factors. Only over 15% were related to the equipment malfunctioning. So human factors still play a major role. And same thing works in our emergencies. It's very rare that the CPR machine or the, uh, the cannula or any equipment is failing. It is this that the human factors which uh, causes most of the emergencies go wrong. So we drill the concept of human factors in these uh, people who attended. We also finally asked, how do you feel in uh, your confidence in dealing with emergencies? And as you can see um, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, before the course, uh, almost like 50% were happy in dealing with emergencies, uh, but post course, most of them moved towards high. So they were absolutely confident in dealing emergencies. And this is what the heart of our course was. We wanted to empower people to deal with emergencies. So that will translate into improving quality of care. And that was one of the major achievement uh, what we got of that particular courses. And the last thing which we always try to uh, drill here is the team performance. So at, an, at any given case, um, your clinical issues will be constant, your knowledge will be constant, but it's your team performance which will completely change the outcome, uh, what is going to happen in any particular case. So uh, work, making people work as a team is the biggest, one of the biggest barriers uh, which um, we came across in India. And when you see the teams um, in London, it's very easy. There's not, not much hierarchy. Uh, in the London team, the consultants, the uh, registrars, junior doctors, and the nurses work as a team. We all address uh, um, each other by first names. And uh, so uh, you don't see that hierarchy. But as in India, uh, when I was working in India, I could see that hierarchy. The consultant was always superior. Whatever he told uh, was the verdict. The juniors, registrars, and the SHOs would not question the consultant. And they all would call them sir. And uh, similarly, the nurses, not even a drop of word against any doctors and uh, consultants. So they would completely just do whatever was told. So that teamwork uh, hierarchy was there. So it took us a lot and a lot of time, at least, at least in my unit, to break that barriers for the doctors and nurses to at least know their names. And because it's very important to know people's name during an emergencies. So that team performance was one thing which we always try to tell in these courses. And uh, you can see as per the end of the course, uh, many people uh, clearly appreciated what the teamwork is all about. So these are the three important messages. But there are multiple other feedbacks which we got from people, but these were the three important things which we um, uh, asked in the feedback. Of course, we kept... Uh, uh, some uh, uh, space for people to write on what they thought. And then many people wrote uh, very important things. So people thought it was a, a great uh, learning experience for the whole team, especially for the whole team. It was a fantastic, uh, a good program with a systematic approach for emergencies, excellent faculty, uh, which will modify their uh, approach to emergency. And this uh, SBAR, SBAR is the structured way of communication. Um, so uh, I'm sure we will uh, talk about this later. So this will help you to tell what is the situation where you are in, what is the background, <clears throat> what's your current assessment, and uh, what is your recommendation. That's a quick handover thing, especially during resuscitation or in general hand uh, in your ward rounds as well. Um, so this is something which you can use for an effective communication. So that was the immediate impact. Then we looked at the long-term impact. We got back to people uh, after six months or a year and to find out how uh, things were working. And um, uh, these uh, three people contributed. They have their own uh, hospitals. Uh, Dr. Kedar mentioning that uh, he was able to do this uh, root cause analysis. He had a problem where uh, uh, accidentally and the sodium bicarbonate, um, the different concentration was given to the patient. And instead of uh, usual, usual blame culture, Graham, he told you took a completely different approach this time to do the root cause analysis without disrupting the team with no blame culture. And he found that the team responded very well and his um, uh, unit's uh, performance has uh, superbly 
improved in the last few days. So that's one of the feedback which we got after a year. Similarly, Dr. Nitin, uh, who can told me that uh, um, he was able to improve the admission uh, temperature uh, following uh, the uh, 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 things which they could do, all the small things which they can uh, tighten. And also Dr. Amit telling that uh, working as a team, knowing people's names, and um, uh, this helped them, especially in the resuscitation of birth, running multiple simulations, and that is what was the key. So these were some of the long-term impact feedback which we got from people. So we had a prototype uh, which was validated both at the acute time and also in the long term. So once we were quite happy with um, what uh, we had seen, we had tightened the nooses um, in our uh, uh, course and then uh, we were started scaling it up. So that is the stage three of uh, the uh, idea. So we started uh, building collaborations. So we built a vast uh, nest network uh, in uh, India. So in order to have multiple trainers, we started doing something called as the trainer of the trainer courses so that we can increase the uh, number of uh, trainers in these uh, courses. We started doing strategic planning. We went to tier one and tier two cities. And so, so far uh, we have done about 62 nest programs in India and 17 train of the trainers. And in order to um, keep it evidence-based, all these uh, feedback which we have got, we have published them uh, so that people can see uh, if there is any uh, information which they need, it's all available on um, the publications. Then we started moving into partnership with uh, the industry experts. So we partner with Ladl and Ladl uh, takes our services to uh, run their, their own courses. So they provide the mannequins, but they did not have people who can use these mannequins. And so we partnered with uh, Ladl and uh, pre-pandemic, we were running all the courses for uh, Ladl in uh, India. And then of course the pandemic had slowed down a few things, but I'll tell you how things have improved post when, during the pandemic as well. And of course, uh, <clears throat> we started spreading out. Um, Syed and myself have run the courses in uh, uh, Riyadh. Uh, Syed has run courses in Sri Lanka and Nepal. So these were all the ways how we started uh, uh, scaling up. So this, as Syed had showed initially, the McDonald's. Uh, so probably you can say it's like a McDonald's model. So once you get your things right, you can start spreading out quickly. Uh, so that's one of the pictures from the TOT uh, courses. And before every course, uh, we, the faculty, would uh, look at all the places and uh, clearly uh, inspect and see if things are ready for the uh, training. So we don't usually leave it to the local uh, faculty because we feel that it's important for us to be there and understand what it is and stuff. So this is the right picture shows all the faculty. Uh, this is from uh, Riyadh uh, when uh, me and uh, um, uh, Syed ran the course uh, pre-pandemic. So we had completed about uh, four courses and uh, at least one uh, TOT. Um, so uh, so we the whole idea at that time was to uh, build the capacity uh, in um, uh, Riyadh as well. So uh, that's the pictures from uh, uh, from Saudi's courses. So that is the main thing which I wanted to tell in terms of uh, how to get your idea into a prototype and then validate and then expand. Now, Syed showed you this uh, same uh, uh, CRM principles and there are multiple principles. So, so you have to see what principle works for you when you want to bring about a change, how you want to uh, do it in your place. So each individual phase um, of starting something new will have some challenges. And so the secret is knowing your strengths and then also the weakness, but you should know how to overcome those weakness. So that is the major thing. So for us in this uh, next journey, the tools out of all the CRM principles what we used was uh, stable and effective leadership. So leadership is in different, different styles. You can be dictator, you can be a coaching style and so on. So we used various forms of leadership uh, during this uh, next journey to, it's not a, a simple job to handle people and especially um, in India where each, every consultant uh, will feel that they're quite egoistic that oh, how can, uh, 
I be at I attend as a um, delegate uh, because I am a, I know everything, so I should be a trainer. So it took us a lot of uh, cultural change to uh, bring the senior consultants as delegates because they had never seen simulation. What simulation is about? So we never took any senior consultant directly as faculty. We made them, we convinced them, and that is what the leadership was about. So we could talk to them and we could tell them that you have to attend as a delegate. That's when you get the maximum amount of it. And then you yourself will transform. To, and uh, many consultants who attended as a delegate really told that, yes, this is uh, not that I learned something new. I'm actually transformed uh, about how these courses and how what changes I can make. And the second important thing uh, tool which we used was an effective communication, uh, communication within the teams, within the faculty, when we communicate to the delegates and the debriefing. The debriefing is the most important crux of the simulation. So uh, that is the important bit, uh, how you, and that comes with experience. And so that's why we would always say, whenever um, you are scaling up, you always forget the heart, why we, we're doing this course uh, in the first place. So the third important aspect was quality control. We made sure that there was, we had about 10, 15 core faculty, and then these core faculty were present in every course. Although the new courses had maybe two or three new faculty, but there was one core faculty who had um, this experience of the debriefing. And so before every course starts, they would group with the faculty, discuss how the course to be run and so on. So we had an absolute quality control on the course so that uh, we could uh, deliver every course at the same standard as the course number one. And then we evolved and we disrupted the ecosystem in India. So this is a big cultural change where doctors and nurses are doing the same course had never happened since 2012, because previously it was always the doctor's courses and always the nurse's courses. There was no way a doctor and nurse course were together. And this was one of the course where we could get them work together. They were part of the same research team, which happens in real life, but it was very difficult cultural change for people to work together. So we disrupted the ecosystem and that's how the new ideas always start. You have to disrupt the ecosystem. And the final thing was that we always say it's just not the equipment because people think simulation is all about the equipment. They bring high fight uh, dolls and uh, mannequins and so on, and uh, they get focused. It is one of the important thing. I'm not going to say it is not uh, uh, important. It's very important to have a high tech doll, but you need to have that uh, debriefing skills. You need to have that leadership skills, communication skills. So it is the package. And in that package, you need to create that magic. And that magic is where you will need to transform the delegate. Instead of making the change, you need to transform them. So that transformation is what you will get in these uh, uh, courses. And that's the, uh, the publication which we had uh, uh, put up a few uh, years back, pre-pandemic. Now, uh, this is all about India. So my experience on the uh, Riyadh, the Nest course, uh, so travel was always a tedious bit. So uh, coming uh, for about four or five days, um, leaving your work and family, um, that was one thing. But of course, uh, and now we have uh, built up the um, uh, local capacity in the National Guards Hospital where we did the course. Uh, so that is something which we are really proud that there are some people who can help us. And then with the online platforms, now it's so easy to run an online course. So we can still be remotely in London or in India, but still be, be uh, being in the course um, virtually and making sure the quality of content uh, is uh, delivered appropriately. So that is one of the challenges which I thought. Second thing um, in, of course, uh, Riyadh was multi-ethnic, just like London. Uh, in India, you don't see predominantly it's only Indians, whereas in uh, Riyadh, we had uh, people from different ethnic backgrounds and multiple specialities, which is one thing which we saw uh, because uh, India, we usually have doctors and nurses working as a, a team. In Riyadh, we used to have, I saw people who were respiratory therapists and uh, uh, physiotherapists who were on the course. So they are a part of the thing, but uh, they, uh, so we had to adapt the courses to suit what they do because I can't ask a respiratory therapist to attend a delivery and ask them to do delivery because they say, yeah, we never do this. So we had to uh, tweak our things based on um, what uh, needs they uh, have. 
so that was one of the challenges uh, which um, i we felt through during the riyadh course and of course uh, as for any uh, population migratory staff so you see um, the the nurses or keep or doctors who come they stay briefly and then they move on so that was one more thing which i thought because i when i came within uh, four months or five months when the people whom we had taught many of them had left and then we had to restart from the first so that's something which is always there so migratory staff so you have to keep doing multiple courses to keep building the skills because that's how you can maintain the quality in your places and of course uh, riyadh also i could see the hierarchy just like india uh, so there was the consultants were in the higher uh, were completely different and the nurses were completely different so pretty much the same uh, thing like india so it will take time to break this uh, hierarchy so these were the challenges which i could see in my experience in the riyadh uh, courses so uh, to summarize what i have tried to convey i mean uh, what i have tried to convey in the last uh, 15 20 minutes is that simulation is a very good tool and it will definitely empower the professional so whenever you run simulations you can empower your nurses your doctors who will attend these things and once you empower them once you build your local capacity that will translate in improving the quality of care no doubt about that and so what i'll suggest is that uh, have regular courses which will keep building the skill because your population is migrant uh, migratory so you have to keep doing regular courses to build up the skills and that will sustain the quality in wherever you guys are working we are reinventing we are also because of the pandemic uh, a lot of things happened but every stress is a growth for opportunity for us so we need to look at uh, how can we empower people so what we have done is that we have gone to the e nest and we have prototyped we are as i told you i'm going to the same stage i've done the prototype already and now the prototype has been validated and it's been successful now i'm scaling it up so we are now looking at e nest opportunities uh, within our network and of course uh, enest within riyadh as well uh, is something which we are very happy to uh, do it and apart from that as i told one of the important uh, crm principle which worked for us was the leadership and so we have taken that important crm principle and put it as a leadership master class so this can also be run completely on the online um, module so if any of you are interested then that is something which you can contact us as well so i'm really thankful these were the first uh, uh, course um, and all the faculty from the uk when they had come so uh, thank you very much for dr ajay uh, and dr of course dr tayed at that time and uh, these are my coordinates if anyone wants to reach me uh, i'll be more than happy to uh, speak to you guys thank you very much for the opportunity again thank you dr swami and please if anyone has questions put them in the chat or in the q and a section um, i have i'm um, again really interesting presentation i'm very happy with a lot of keywords that you've thrown in there um, validate your courses uh, uh, when you started the, with the needs assessment uh, and how challenging what the covid so it's really important um, another thing we're happy that the saudi simulation brought uh you and dr sayed uh, as experts and uh, i'm sure it's not just riyadh who are interested in in the next course so um uh, hopefully we can have more uh, uh next course throughout the kingdom uh in cooperation with you uh and uh, the last thing is how is very interesting how culture can affect our um content context affecting content like what dr sayed mentioned earlier um when we went to india or triad you have different contexts and you had to change your content to match the context um, yeah um so any um, other questions from our attendees thanks doctor very interesting presentation thanks doctor said for interesting and enlightening presentation so i don't see any 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 other questions but uh, i i i personally will reach you because i'm very interested in in research and how culture can affect our presentation uh, of of our simulation and how can we use actually simulation to bridge 
the 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 the, the, the cultural differences between uh, countries and even between different uh, different uh, practice, practitioners, different disciplines. Um, so if we could one day uh, do the same um, simulation in India and in Saudi and in Britain, and uh, Dr. Said went to a couple of different places also, as you mentioned, and we can compare the outcomes and try to understand the, the differences in the outcomes and how the culture affected our simulation, that would be great. Um, thank you. And Dr. Boker also um, mentioned uh, Prof. Boker, um, great talk. And he's writing a question. What, in your opinion, the relationship uh, between self-reported confidence and competence? So what is your opinion? In the what is in your opinion the relationship between self-reported confidence and competence? Yeah, so uh, it is one of the tool uh, which will um, help us to know whether uh, the people who attended the course are able to deal with emergency. So most people, if at all after every course, they feel very enlightened, they feel uh, in a transcends uh, uh, level that, oh, we have done something new. So maybe at the end of the course, most of them feel uh, like a superhuman being and they all tick, yes, I'm absolutely confident and they're competent now. And so, so that is what we got. But the main crux is to look at the long term and uh, look at what they have done in their hospital. So, um, uh, I can take uh, uh, the question, which is what he was thinking is that uh, if people self-report that I'm absolutely confident and confident, uh, is that does it absolutely translate into quality of care? Maybe, maybe not. That's the thing which we have to wait. But when you see the long-term outcomes and if the long-term outcomes are good, and then you can absolutely say what the person reported at the beginning that confidence and confidence is really working. So this was one of the ways we could get the uh, feedback. And we also took the second way where we went and saw the long-term outcome as well. So uh, that is what I probably I can answer. Uh, Prof. I, I don't know if you have the capacity to, to talk in uh, um, your point. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you have the permission to talk. If you do, that would be great. Uh, Dr. Walker is answering back saying, but now we know that high reported self-confidence might translate into more cowboys in clinical <laughs> practice. So yes, that, that's what we always say. So uh, uh, at the end of the course, everyone uh, gets this uh, thing that yes, we are now invincible. And so we will put out a lot of cowboys uh, uh, into the clinical field. But bear in mind, so these are not uh, uh, people uh, who had uh, uh, never done masters or they've never done uh, medicine. So they're all doctors, but you need that uh, final uh, nudge and that transformation, whenever the transformation kicks in, because the next course is not only change, it's a transformation. So once you click the transformation, you will reach that level of transcendence and then Perhaps uh, I'm probably talking very uh, philosophical here. Um, so that will enable them to do something. Uh, something could be uh, making their practice better. And the only most objective way of getting these is by evidence. And that's why I told you take the feedback after one year, and then you know what they uh, get out. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, like uh, if you allow me, Dr. Bara. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Prof. Boker. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's very interesting, and uh, don't get me wrong. I'm uh, a, a huge supporter for uh, simulation and being there for the last 13, 14, 15 years, done uh, hundreds and thousands of courses, and I think it's uh, we always, you know, like to be. Uh, to put ourselves in some other perspective shoes like uh, the administrators and everything and I tell you from inside from my experience you know like sometimes people could have that high feeling 
yes, we could do things. And, um, you know, in real life, uh, that might translate uh, as, you know, the first speaker said, you know, like they feel that they could swim after this course. But, uh, you know, like learning how to swim in the swimming pool is different than swimming in the ocean. It's not the same swimming because in real life it's different than in simulation. So I think the honest is on us, uh, people working in this field, you know, like uh, we know it's difficult. Uh, we know it's uh, a, a, a difficult task to achieve, to get uh, level three and four uh, chiropractic level outcome, uh, behavioral and outcome changes confirmation. But I think we have to be precise, and maybe more as Dr. Barra said, the more we have volume, the more we have uh, multi-center research, collaboration, training, focused uh, efforts to, you know, like, like what they did with the CLAPSI data, uh, improving uh, CLAPSI uh, and bloodstream infection. It was a very classical good example in which you could actually have an outcome. I'm 100% sure that very well studied uh, conducted uh, based on very good uh, faculty and curriculum mapping and conduct, we one day we could have this evidence in front of us and also for people who are, who are critical at this stage about uh, simulation-based education. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you, Prof. Walker. Uh, we have 33 minutes. Dr. Syed will go back to you for your last presentation. Uh, and we hope for like five minutes and then for questions. So um, I will give it back to you, Dr. Syed. If you could share Thank your you. slides. Uh, I think it's, it doesn't allow me till the other speaker is, yeah, I think it should allow me, hopefully. Yeah, I'll stop sharing now, yeah. Thank you. I I actually think uh, I I couldn't agree more uh, with Doctor uh, with Prof uh, Bucker. Uh, I I think we exactly th this has been our um, both our ob observation and also our concern. I think it's about how do you bring about a culture change. It's not going to be a culture doesn't change uh, in weeks and months or even years, it takes a long time. And that is the reason why some of the centers, um, I, th I think the, the, you know, co any of the centers uh, of excellence, they, they are constantly striving to make sure that A, they continue to hold that culture and continue to strive to excel. And I think that is something that uh, we have to be humble about and and acknowledge that um, it will take some time, it will take effort, and it is, it is a journey which will not stop. It is a relentless ongoing journey. Perhaps that's, that's um, going to be, in fact, it's a shame Sini could not join us because her academic work, I, I don't claim to be an academic, her work is more about uh, looking into these aspects. And she, she was really trying to pursue some of the uh, level three, level four evidence and, uh, and also talking about how um, uh, th these can be sustained, but hopefully next time. But uh, here uh, is our team again. I don't want to, I, I've actually covered some aspects of it. Now, our journey as a service started from um, 2003 when we, uh, we realized that people, uh, in, in fact, in inverted commas, cowboys were doing transfers of sick babies. Uh, these are ventilated patients on inotropes and uh, uh, advanced life support. And uh, literally when, when we did a, a, a census in 2001, we realized that uh, people of varying ability are doing these transfers. Um, there was ad hoc arrangements between these 30 hospitals across London so what, and that was the birth of our service that I, uh, you know, that I lead the London's neonatal transfer service. And in fact, this whole case study itself could be a, a level three evidence. Uh, so we uh, started our first mission, October, 2003. Um, we are almost a teenager and hopefully we'll, <laughs> you know, 18 years on um, from that time. And then, um, a lot has happened since then. And this is our journey of learning and how did we impact culture change? 
using simulation as one of the embedded tools within our service. Um, so we do roughly, we get about 2,200 to 2,400 calls uh, requesting for transfers. Some of them might be advice, some of them inquiries, some of them uh, maybe things which we can't do and pass it on to sister teams. Uh, but we actually transfer about 1,600 uh, patients annually as a service. And our service comprises of senior doctors, uh, nurses, paramedics, and we do all sorts of emergencies, planned, unplanned transfers, and uh, some of them are time critical. Uh, so meaning like perforated NEC going to a, a surgical center, those sort of babies. Um, and, and we do anything from 400 grams up to five kilos. That's the sort of uh, weight remit of our service. So everything's quite tricky and complicated. Um, we, we have uh, a dedicated um, ambulance team, uh, elective team, admin team, training and teaching team. So there is a process that we have and we've standardized the process. I perhaps would not uh, bore you with that detail, but the key thing is we, we have oh, babies who are in hypoxic respiratory failure in 100% oxygen. Uh, we do inhaled nitric oxide therapy on transport. We, we do cooling, which is providing therapeutic hypothermia on transport. We look after all sorts of surgical babies, including perforated NECs. Um, and there are many reasons why our emergency uplifts happen. So for example, if you have a small district general hospital, which only looks after babies who are um, either non-ventilated babies or ventilated, but uh, for only for a short time, like 24, 48 hours. So they will then request a transfer to a higher center. And that's, that will be the kind of uplift of care that we provide or extreme preemie babies uh, or those requiring unexpected, un un unanticipated uh, need for intensive care or sometimes capacity because they just can't cope with the workload. Sometimes we transfer for specialist reasons like neurosurgery um, or cardiac surgery or um, duct ligation in babies uh, with uh, problem ducts. Uh, and sometimes for a retinopathy of prematurity therapy, uh, either with laser or um, injection. Um, so those are the kind of remit that we do. But, but here's the, 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 so although that's our business side of things, the key thing is as a team, what are the inbuilt things that we simulate, train, and inculcate, embed as a culture, looking after one another. So here's a, you know, you, you will have um, uh, almost a program in which we make sure that we shallow the hierarchy as Ravi was speaking. It's not about turning to the person who's just joined yesterday as a fellow and saying, I'm the boss here. I'm, no, it, it is about uh, showing that if they have a clinical concern, uh, listening to them, to, to allow them that space where they can say, uh, uh, look, doctor, I feel this is why I want to do it this way. Uh, and, uh, and, and I hear what you're saying, but having that ability, the confidence in which my juniors, my, my nurses can come to me and, and really speak their mind uh, in, a, in a professional manner. So allowing that shallow hierarchy we constantly, we have a model in which we start our day with a briefing. We do carry out anything like a transfer and then we debrief. So that is an embedded culture within our team. Uh, we discuss every single emergency that we uh, look after. So every patient case gets discussed, not just in the clinical angle, but in the operational human factors angle. Uh, we constantly, we just don't discuss our cases with our, within our own self. We create, especially the one of the legacy of COVID has been, we, we schedule a team's meeting with the referring hospital, with the receiving hospital and our team. And it's a lovely discussion, which is uh, facilitated. And that's where the crux is facilitated so that the, the safety is maintained, human factors are brought out, and, and really people can speak their mind as to why things did not go as per plan, or if they did go as per plan, what made it a success story? Uh, and, and this is the thing, it's about psychological safety. So not only we provide psychological safety, we're very open to receiving psychological support. So there is a, a 20, uh, there is a uh, not 24 seven, but there is a, 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 a full-time 
psycho psychological support available for any of the team members should they need it. And of course, this is embedded on a platform of simulation team building. So this is uh, us having a case discussion after a transfer and, and most of our team are again, multi-ethnic, multi multicultural, and we have people, uh, fellows who come from all over the place. So, uh, you know, we, we've got, um, uh, you know, people from Canada here, we've got people visiting from Europe here. Uh, we've got actually um, uh, 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 a senior clinical fellow who was visiting to us from Kuwait. Um, we, we had, uh, um, uh, and again, our faculty and our staff are all multicultural, multi-ethnic. Now, I don't think we need to labor this anymore. We, we know that at the end of the day, it is about imitating something real, but if you make sure that that is happening all the time, it becomes second nature. It becomes something that you are not specially doing. It is part of your everyday uh, language and process. Uh, and I, I don't think, again, we need to impress upon that most of the problems that happen are not because of clinical errors, but because of human factors. And if we can address that, that itself will be the evidence. If, if our errors reduce, if our preventable errors can come down, um, that is the real proof of uh, what's happening. And uh, we also pay a little bit of attention to ergonomics being a transport team. So the way we design our equipment, the way, where should the monitor be? Just like uh, in a car, a good high quality cars, make sure that your seating is comfortable, that your eyes are on the road, that you can see your mirrors, that you can actually have all the controls and buttons that uh, available to you as and when you need it. So we're doing exactly the same thinking, but in a, in the design of our ambulance trolleys, uh, in the design of our rigs, in the dis design of our patient monitors. So we have an in-house clinical engineering team who partner with us in trying to make sure that our ergonomics are uh, world-class. And I think this is really the crux of human factors. We, we, we talk about uh, in this sort of, we talk about liveware. Liveware is all the people. Now, whether you are a porter, whether you are a, um, administrator, you are a clerk, you are a clinician, it doesn't matter. Every single interaction, human interaction uh, is a liveware and we want to make sure that uh, they, they have the sort of right knowledge, the right attitude. They are, they are aware of the stress, what stresses people. They're aware of how to recognize fatigue and they are able to say that. And uh, it's a two-way process. So where, that's where the leadership comes in. If, if one of my colleagues says that, look, I've been driving um, 200 miles today and I feel tired, I can't do the next transfer. I still got three hours in my shift. I don't turn around and say, you, you still got three, around, three hours in your shift. You have to do this. No, I actually understand and say, okay, if you feel unsafe, that's so be it. But it, it becomes a... a, 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 a a collaboration of trust, respect, and making sure people don't abuse the system as well. And it's such a delicate ecosystem. Uh, so apart from live where you've got the software and the software means not just the, the, the electronic things, but also your guidelines, your protocols, your standard operating procedures. How do you uh, use this stuff? How do you find where this stuff is placed? So everything, every single thing has got, um, you know, both paper-based and soft copies of where to find it, how to use it videos that we've created as part of our embedded process. Uh, then comes the hardware. Of course, you, you got to have your uh, ventilators, you got to have your transport rig, you got to have your incubator um, pumps, you got to have your uh, ambulance. Uh, all this is machinery and anything can go wrong. So the question is, how do you make sure you've got checks which are embedded every single day, every single equipment is checked. And we have programs like uh, iAuditor, which we use to, uh, to carry on these checks and it has got an audit trail. So, and that is again, embedded safety and we, we simulate on it every single day. So it's like simulations part of our life. Um, then we have the environment, uh, things can change. So it is uh, London's a city where it can both be sunny, rain and snow in one day. Uh, and, and how do you adapt to that? 
How do you make sure that you are not distracted by the noises, by the smells, by the layout, by the people, um, by the commotion that happens? Uh, so it's about being aware. I think awareness is the word of your physical and organizational environment. And then there are other things. And that's where I think as, uh, as we've heard um, the, uh, the prof say, and I think Dr. Barra say, uh, it's about culture. I think culture plays a huge, huge role and being open and being aware of the culture is something that uh, one has to uh, actively uh, pursue and, and, and it's very important to effective teamwork. So uh, of course, you know, part of this learning is teamwork, leadership, communication, decision-making and situational awareness. And that is the, the competencies that we work on for all the people who take part in our team and who come to us for uh, their training. Uh, we uh, we have um, you know uh, we have our embedded simulation in situ simulation we have simulation days and then we have these special courses that we uh, create uh, and and we focus on uh, not just clinical aspects we focus on all sorts of things in our simulation uh, this is our new uh, well this is our home built incubator as we call it it is a simulation incubator. Uh, the whole thing is uh, simulated. The, the ventilator is simulated, the, um, the monitor is simulated, the patient, of course, is simulated, the whole trolley itself is simulated, and it's got equipment which is, it mim mimics the real equipment, but it can change, all parameters can change on it. So it's, it's both uh, academic work and a, and a collaborative piece with our engineering and with our physics uh, 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 departments in the university. Um, this is how we're doing simulation in the ambulance. So that's our uh, lead nurse and uh, ambulance tech who are uh, taking part in a simulation. And again, we all put ourselves through simulation. It's not like the professor doesn't do simulation or the lead consultant or the lead nurse doesn't do simulation. Everyone takes part in simulation and that's the culture. We lead by example, we model be behaviors which we expect out of our teams. Um, and Equipment training is uh, it's part of the process. Uh, so every everyone goes through every piece of equipment so that they can troubleshoot it, they can manage it uh, wherever they are because we will take this equipment and go to all the different hospitals. And uh, here's uh, another sort of photograph uh, showing our little sim doll. And we have both high-tech sim dolls, but most of the time we don't use high-tech sim dolls. We use low-tech sim dolls. So uh, contrary to popular belief that actually you don't need a lot of high tech kit. You need to do lots of it, uh, but really use the conversation, the learning conversation to try and bring about that cultural shift that that transformation Ravi was talking about. And of course, uh, you, you got to have the clinical approach, the ABCDE, we also do palliative care, uh, um, we, we do palliative care um, uh, simulations in which uh, we have actors or sometimes staff be the parents and how do you communicate when a baby is uh, terminally ill or is dying and you cannot re so sometimes it's not about happy clappy endings it's about real life this is what you will have to handle we have difficult airway simulations um, uh, then in terms of non-clinical we really focus on communication and also processes for graded assertiveness the pace tool that we use um, and we have, uh, we also simulate our, and, and uh, also check and cross check our processes and protocols because you might pick up latent errors as you simulate. And then I mentioned in my previous talk about Lego serious play and, um, and, and uh, another sort of, uh, uh, you know, how they talk about whispers going through. So we call that string communication model. Uh, so we do uh, these kind of simulations. Um, then COVID provided us with, of course, a lot of challenge, but it also provided with, uh, us with the opportunity to do a few things. One is um, the fact that you know, nobody knew what to do. So we had to really jack up and, and, and come together and create policies and protocols and simulate them. And communication, as I briefly mentioned earlier, I think it brought a huge focus to communication or the lack of it and how losing our non-verbal non communication was such a blow. And so how we needed to make sure our verbal communication was streamlined. 
uh, and then it brought a lot more process and planning because uh, having PPE and, and, and doing critical care on the move was not easy. Uh, and this is one of our um, uh, COVID simulation with all the PPE in place. Um, uh, then, uh, of course, the NEST as a concept, we talked about the number of courses we've done in London. And then we've uh, also you know, created another course called the STAN, which is Stabilization of the Acutely Unwell Neonate. And then we created an interface between pediatrics and neonates, called it the picnic courses. And we work along with the, with the pediatric retrieval team in London. We've done some courses in UK, and we've also actually done some picnic courses in India now. Um, so as part of our, um, so the, the crux of the matter is, it's not just okay to do simulation. How do you create and embed it within your team and create a culture wherein simulation is accepted? But the next challenge was we needed a platform. So we created a new neonatal skills website wherein our uh, courses are uh, advertised, administered, and, and um, most of it is automated work, but it's all in-house. So it's part of our sort of um, uh, platform wherein we can showcase the courses, which is happening. And then um, we partnered with our um, um, SIM center to, to standardize our faculty training. So this is our BART's Health uh, Simulation Center, which is quite advanced state of the art, but it's not about uh, the, 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 the center, it's about the ethos of training the faculty. And, and I think that's where we've invested in. And, and uh, hopefully, we, I mean, we all sing from the same sort of page as they call it. And networks and collaboration. And I, I think as, um, uh, as Dr. Bara said, and uh, I think Prof said as well, uh, it, it is about having that, um, both the legacy that, I mean, Bart's health has been there for over for almost, I think started in uh, late 1500s. So there's a legacy of network and collaboration. And I think that continues. Um, and that uh, we, we collaborate and communicate with uh, 30 other hospitals in, in London, but it's not been that difficult. I think we all, if the vision is aligned, I think it's so easy for people to uh, join hands. Uh, of course, egos uh, and centers and politics can come in, but we've tried to steer clear of that and focus more on the vision. And uh, as part of that culture of innovation, we created something called the Neomate, which is a smartphone app. I'll just play this video, hope it works. It's the middle of the night and baby Sophie is about to be born. The neonatal team arrives on labor ward. Sophie is very premature and will need to be transferred to a tertiary neonatal intensive care unit. But first, she must be stabilized. The next hour will be critical. They use an app called Neomate, which has a concise checklist for this situation. It helps them to remember important steps that even highly skilled professionals could miss. They do a team briefing and they run through the checklist together. Everyone feels prepared and knows what they're going to do. Sophie is born. Neomate calculates the optimum ET tube size and length and provides measurements for insertion of her umbilical lines. It provides doses for emergency drugs and assists with the complicated task of prescribing infusions. The app reduces prescribing errors which are more likely in stressful situations. A specialist neonatal transfer team arrives to pick up Sophie. They compliment the team on a job well done. The team updates Sophie's parents, feeling assured that Sophie has been given the best possible start in life. Neomate the app for neonatal doctors and nurses. Download it for free today and please share this to help spread the word. Um, thankfully, this app won the NHS Innovation Prize. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's, it's about, I think it's about collaborating, sharing, thinking what else is possible and going beyond. So I'll stop there because our, the, the ethos has been to embed things within in-house, but also extend the hand and really share the learning. And then as Ravi said, it's also about scaling the process uh, because if we can do it, uh, you can do it, everyone can do it. 
Uh, it's, it's about how do we learn and share that know-how and collaborate. And I think as, uh, as we've already touched upon, uh, sharing this experience, not just in a clinical context, but an academic and uh, perspective and gathering evidence really is also key. I'll leave you with my email in case you want to make contact. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I can't hear you, Dr. Bara. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Sayed. So we actually have one question posted by Ahmad Al-Bashri saying, should simulation concepts and method be changeable slash modifiable from country to country and different cultures? Uh, did I understand it right that it is simulation methods, did he say? No, should we, can, should the concepts and method be modifiable between countries or different cultures? I, as I said, I think the, the, the guiding principles, the context uh, remains the same. And in fact, you alluded to it. The content can vary. I think you got to adopt it. You got to make sure that it works for you. So the same, I mean, we do 23 week premies in, in UK, whereas that will not be applicable to India, for example, or, or Nepal, whereas the main problem there may be uh, temperature management or infection control or, or stabilization of a term baby. So I think it's about focusing on where your, uh, the local priorities are. And so modifying the content, whereas the context can remain the same, the guiding principles can remain the same more or less. Thank you, Dr. Syed. Um, um, do you have any more questions? Um, I mean, uh, I'm already downloading the new Mate app. Um, in my in my phone, um, as you said, sometimes as a an anesthesiologist, hearing a five hundred gram baby is coming or six hundred gram, it's quite scary. And and God bless all of the neonatologists for taking this uh, difficult task, actually caring for really sick small babies. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, uh, if there are no other questions for, from our colleagues uh, or attendants, uh, uh, we would like to thank you, Dr. Sayed and uh, Dr. Ravi for your excellent, excellent presentation. And we hope this presentation is just the start of new cooperation with, with the Saudi Society of Health Simulation and other areas in, in, in our country uh, where we can. Uh, make a global change uh, with the current global uh, uh, and future global uh, challenges that we're going to have. Uh, thank you. Excellent presentations. Um, and uh, would we'll call it off for today. Uh, thank you for your time. Most grateful for having us. And please, uh, we'll be very honored to collaborate and work with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah.